Okay, so chapter 20 is infections of the cardiovascular system. Um, the cardiovascular system is going to include the heart, uh, as you can see here, uh, which is the main pump that sort of creates the whole circulatory system or movement within the circulatory system. Uh, if you look at the circulatory system, uh, it's going to pump blood in a closed system. Uh, the heart is the pump. The blood vessels will carry the blood to and from all regions of the body. And it provides the tissues with the oxygen nutrients that they need. And it will also remove any metabolic waste and CO2 uh, from those said tissues. Uh, the blood vessels, these will include your arteries, which carry blood away from the heart, and the arterioles, which are the smaller branches. Uh, the veins, which will carry blood towards the heart, and the venules are the smaller veins. And then the capillaries are at the level of the tissues where you get gas exchange. The lymphatic system, uh, this is a major source of immune cells and fluids. It consists mainly of lymphatic vessels. Uh, it's roughly parallel to the blood vessels as far as the structures are concerned. Uh, you do have lymph nodes, uh, which are clustered at the groin, neck, armpit, and intestines. Uh, and then you also have the spleen. Uh, the lymphatic system will collect fluid that has left the blood vessels and entered into the tissues. It will filter it of impurities and infectious agents, and it will return it to the blood. Now, one of the issues with infections in both the lymphatic and cardiovascular systems is that they are both systemic systems, which means that infections could spread throughout the entire body. Uh, the defenses of the cardiovascular system are highly protected from microbial infection. Uh, microbes that invade the system gain access to every part of the body and can affect every system causing systemic infections. Your defenses in the bloodstream, you have about 5,000 to 10,000 white blood cells per mil of blood. Uh, the lymphocytes are involved in specific immunity, but then you also have lots of phagocytic cells, which are critical to specific and non-specific immune defenses. Uh, some medical conditions that involve the blood. Uh, viremia is a viral infection in the blood that can uh, potentially cause uh, meningitis. Fungemia, this is fungal infections in the blood. Bacteremia is the presence of bacteria in the blood. And septicemia is bacteria flourishing and growing in the bloodstream. This can lead to decreased blood pressure, which can lead to a condition referred to as septic shock. Um, normal microbiota of the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. Like the nervous system, the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems are closed. Um, you have uh, current science believes that they possess no normal biota. Microorganisms can be present transiently, but no microbes colonize the lymphatic or cardiovascular systems. And recent data from the Human Microbiome Project uh, suggests the bloodstream is not completely sterile, uh, even during apparent periods of apparent health. Low level microbial infections may contribute to diseases for which no infectious cause has been identified. And here uh, you can see the defense mechanisms and the normal microbiota for both the cardiovascular and lymphatic systems. Again, these are also referred to as sterile sites. You should not expect to see any organisms present uh, taking up residence in either the cardiovascular or lymphatic systems. All right, the first uh, disease is endocarditis. Uh, this is inflammation of the inner lining of the heart. It can be acute or subacute. This can lead to damage of uh, the heart valves or prosthetic heart valves uh, and predispose patients to um, endocarditis. This can also be caused by uh, vascular trauma or circulating immune complexes. Symptoms of endocarditis, uh, you have fever, anemia, abnormal heartbeat, uh, symptoms of heart attack, shortness of breath, chills. Uh, you can have abdominal or side pain, Janway lesions or ul ulcers, nodules. 
symptoms of subacute endocarditis. This is similar to the symptoms of acute endocarditis. Will develop more slowly and are less pronounced. Um, and you can have an enlarged spleen, club fingers, and toes. Um, so causes for acute endocarditis, this could be staph, strep species, um, very common organisms that colonize a lot of areas of the body. Subacute endocarditis, this is always gonna be alpha hemolytic uh, streptococci species. Sepsis or call, also called septicemia. This occurs when an organisms are actively multiplying in the blood. Signs and symptoms include fever, altered mental state, shaking, chills, gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, an increased breathing rate, respiratory alkalosis, low blood pressure, uh, resulting in loss of fluid from the vasculature. Um, if sepsis is not treated, uh, this can actually eventually lead into endotoxic shock, which is the result of gram-negative bacteria multiplying in the bloodstream, releasing endotoxin. The problem with this is that this gets released upon lysis of the cell. Unfortunately, treatment with antibiotics will cause a lot of these cells to lyse. And by treating with antibiotics, um, this is going to end up releasing uh, endotoxin, uh, which ultimately then can cause blood pressure to drop. Uh, and if you already have a patient that is septic, uh, sepsis itself can actually cause blood pressure to drop. So it can get to a very, say, very serious uh, state uh, with treating somebody with one of these gram negative uh, infections as a result of causing sepsis. Gram positive bacteria can instigate a similar series of events when fragments of the cell wall are released into the bloodstream as well. Um, as far as sepsis is concerned, the disease table, uh, you know, any bacteria or fungal species that gets into the blood uh, can cause sepsis. Uh, in the United States, we have about 1.7 million cases per year. A lot of times these can also result from possible acquired infections, and we see approximately about 270,000 deaths as a result uh, from the 1.7 million cases. Uh, the plague, uh, there are three manifestations of the plague. You have pneumonic plague, bubonic, and septicemic plague. Pneumonic plague is a respiratory disease. Uh, bubonic plague, this is an infection that causes inflammation and necrosis of the lymph node or bubo. Mortality rate, even with treatment, can reach 15% with bubonic plague. Septicemic plate, this results in disseminated intravascular coagulation, uh, subcutaneous hemorrhage. And uh, you can see upwards of 30 to 50% mortality rate with treatment. Without treatment, uh, you're looking at about 100% mortality rate. Here you can see the bubonic plague. Um, Uh, with these buba that are formed within the lymph nodes. Uh, you know, you have your lymph nodes underneath your axillary region and within the groin. Uh, reported cases of uh, plague in the United States uh, from 1970 to 2017. Uh, this is not really something that we see a whole lot of um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very, uh, very rare here in the United States. Um, the infection cycle of Yersinius pestis. Um, Yersinius pestis is uh, fleas. Uh, and this is actually um, uh, how the plague gets transmitted. Uh, the plague involves several different types of vertebrate host and flea vectors, fleas are the vectors. And its exact cycle varies from one region to another. A general scheme of the cycle is presented here. Endemic reserve hosts include mice, 
amplifying hosts include chipmunks and ground squirrels, and humans are accidental hosts. Humans can develop plague through contact with the fleas of wild, domestic, and semi-domestic animals. Contact with infected body fluids can also spread the disease. If a person has breaks in the skin on his or her hands, handling infected animals or animal skins is a possible means of transmission. And persons with uh, pneumonic form of the disease can spread spread it uh, through respiratory droplets. You know, so in this little image here, you know, he can cough and spread it to her causing uh, pneumonic plague. Um, so the causative agent for uh, the plague is Yersinius pestis, uh, and it's transmitted by a uh, vector of fleas. Tularemia. Uh, this is another zoonotic disease along with rabies that we talked about in the last chapter. Uh, again, a zoonotic disease is one in which you can um, Um, <clears throat> transmit from one animal species to another. Uh, this is a zoonotic disease that's endemic throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Symptoms include headache, backache, fever, chills, malice, and weakness. Uh, signs include ulcerative skin lesions, swollen lymph glands, uh, conjunctival inflammation, sore throat, intestinal disruption, uh, pulmonary involvement, and without proper treatment, mortality rate can climb as high as 30%. And here you can see one of those ulcerations on the skin. Uh, the, the causative agent for tularemia is Franciella tularensis. It's a gram-negative facultative parasite. Uh, and there is an infectious dose, meaning there's a minimum amount that you have to be exposed to uh, in order for it to become infectious. It is considered a uh, category A bioterroristic agent. Uh, rabbits and rodents are the chief reservoirs, skunks, beavers, Possums, foxes, and other wild animals can also act as reservoirs. Um, and here's the table that sort of summarizes um, tularemia. Lyme disease, uh, living in the Northeast United States, we are uh, living in the endemic area for Lyme disease. Um, it was first discovered in old Lyme. Um, Connecticut in the 1970s. It is a slow, um, acting progressive syndrome. Uh, early symptoms is character, characteristic uh, bullseye rash, fever, headaches, stiff neck, dizziness. It can progress into cardiac and neurological symptoms and it develops into crippling polyarthritis. Um, after several weeks or months. The causative agent for Lyme disease is Borrelia burgdorferi. Uh, it's a relatively large spirochete with three to 10 irregularly spaced coils. It evades the immune system by changing surface antigens. It has multiple proteins for attachment to host cells. And it's also possible that immune response uh, contributes to the pathology of the disease. Uh, again, here's the summary table. In the United States, we do see about 25 to 30,000 cases per year endemic in North America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, and treatment is doxycycline or amoxicillin for about three to four weeks, which is actually a fairly long course of treatment. Uh, and it's transmitted by ticks. Uh, infectious mononucleosis. Uh, this is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. It uh, shares morphological and antigenic features with other herpes viruses. Uh, it contains a circular form of DNA that is readily spliced into the host cell DNA. Latency and ability to splice into the host cell allows the evade host immune responses. More than 90% of the world's population has been infected with Epstein-Barr virus. That number really increases as you hit the age of 50. Uh, 
Uh, and here's a blood smear where you can see uh, histology of lymphocytes that are affected with Epstein-Barr virus. You can see a normal lymphocyte uh, down here versus a atypical lymphocyte as a result of being infected with Epstein-Barr. Uh, anthrax. Anthrax is called by Bacillus anthracis. This is another zoonotic disease. Uh, it can be cutaneous, pulmonary, or GI, gastrointestinal. Uh, and you can also have uh, a meningitis form of the disease. The, the disease. Um, Gram-positive endospore-forming rod. Uh, you have aerobic and cata catalase positive, uh, and it forms uh, a toxin as well. Uh, this was used as a bioterroristic agent in 2001, uh, uh, and internationally we do see about 2,000 to 20,000 cases per year. Uh, but like I said, this is also used as bioterroristic agent. Um, your hemorrhagic fever diseases. Uh, these are agents that infect the blood and lymphatics. Uh, extreme fevers accompanied by internal hemorrhaging. Uh, these are RNA enveloped viruses. And they are distributed, re, distribution is related to, to the distribution of the um, Aedes uh, genus of the mosquito. <clears throat> and the prevalence fluctuates due to global warming patterns. Some important uh, hemorrhagic fevers, yellow fever, dengue, um, or Ebola, Marburg, are probably the more common ones that people have heard of. Uh, Ebola and Marburg are endemic to Africa. Uh, Lassa fever is another one. Uh, going back to Ebola, we did have an outbreak in the United States. Uh, I think it was 2015 uh, with Ebola. And here's some tables that just sort of summarize these uh, hemorrhagic fevers. Again, they, they can have very high uh, mortality rates. Uh, for example, uh, yeah, it was 2015 in the U.S., uh, for Ebola, the problem is with Ebola is the mortality rate could be upwards of 90%. And the reason is, is that the patients that are infected with Ebola must have a uh, constant, constant care around the clock. And unfortunately, in a lot of areas where this is uh, an epidemic, uh, that is not an option. Uh, and what results, unfortunately, is um, <clears throat> death. Uh, in the United States, we did have seven cases. There was one patient that did die. Unfortunately, by the time he was diagnosed with Ebola, he had been too far along. Uh, the remaining seven cases or six cases, uh, they all survived uh, due to the access to health care that we have here in this country. Uh, some non-hemorrhagic fevers. These are diseases that are characterized by high fever, but without leading to capillary uh, fragility, which can lead to the hemorrhaging. Um, some important ones that we'll talk about are cat scratch disease, uh, babesiosis uh, are two of the major ones, uh, and brucelle, bruce, uh, brucella. Um, this is also referred to as Malta fever. Uh, this is a gram-negative coxobacilli. Uh, it will live in phagocytic cells that carry bacteria into the bloodstream, causing focal lesions in the liver, spleen, and bone marrow, and kidney. Its most prominent manifestation of human uh, brucellosis is a fluctuating pattern of fever, which is the origin of the common name undulant fever. Cat scratch disease. This is caused by Bartnell Hensley. Uh, it is a small ground negative rod that is fastidious, uh, will grow on blood auger. Uh, the infection is connected with being clawed or bitten by a cat. It is present in over 40% of cats. Symptoms will start one to two weeks after a claw or a bite. And cluster of small uh, papules at the inoculation site uh, is a symptom that you'll oftentimes see with this. The lymph nodes will swell and become pus filled and a third of patients will also experience a high fever. Um, You guys can skip uh, trench fever, erloculosis, and uh, babesiosis. Uh, don't worry about those three. Um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
Uh, this uh, mainly occurs in the southeast and eastern seaboard regions of the United States, Canada, Central and South America. Uh, Rickettsia, Rickettsiae, uh, it's transmitted by hard ticks and transmissions cause uh, symptoms, which include chills, fever, headache, muscle pain. Uh, distinctive spotted rash occurs two to four days after the prodrome. Uh, if untreated, lesions will merge to become necrotic. This can lead to cardiovascular disruption, hypotension, thrombosis, which is forming blood clots and hemorrhaging. 20% uh, mortality if left untreated, five to 10% mortality if treated. Uh, and here you can see one of the hard ticks uh, associated with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So again, uh, here's a table that sort of summarizes the non-hemorrhagic fevers, uh, wants to focus on cat scratch disease, uh, and then spot, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, those were the two that I really focused on. Malaria. Malaria is one of those diseases that's very prevalent worldwide. Uh, signs and symptoms occur 48 to 72 hour intervals. Uh, they include malice, fatigue, aches, nausea, with or without diarrhea, uh, chills, fever, and sweating. Uh, it's caused by um, falciparum malaria, is persistent fever, cough, and weakness for weeks without relief. Cerebral malaria, this is small blood vessels in the brain become obstructed, which can lead to a comatose state or even death. Uh, plasmodium uh, is the causative agent for malaria and infects red blood cells. And there are five main types of plasmodium. You don't need to know the individual types. Um, but these plasmodium species are the causative agents for malaria. Uh, the pathogenesis of malaria, you have the invasion of the merozoites uh, into the red blood cells will cause the release of fever inducing chemicals into the bloodstream. The plasmodium metabolizes glucose at a high rate. You'll get damage to red blood cells causing anemia. Red blood cell adhesion to blood vessels in the brain adds to its virulence and the parasite can go under go uh, genetic var variation which is another fancy way of saying that it can evade uh, the host immune responses. As far as where we find malaria, it's really sort of centered in these yellow areas here in the world. Uh, it's transmitted by the Anopheles mosquito. Uh, it's restricted to the belt extending around the equator. We actually see about 200 million new cases reported per year, 90% of those in Africa. About 500,000 children and young adults die annually uh, as a result of contracting malaria. Prevention from malaria, um, you have long-term mosquito abatement. This is treating for mosquitoes. Um, in the United States, this is something that we practice very heavily where they'll typically treat a lot of crops and fields and open spaces uh, by spraying. Uh, this. Also, you wanna make sure that you do not have any standing water, uh, spraying the insecticides uh, and introducing sterile male mosquitoes into the population. And uh, also using, if it is an issue in the area in which you live, especially in those equator countries, um, sleeping underneath of mosquito nets so that you are not uh, bitten by the mosquito. Okay, HIV uh, stands for human immunodeficiency virus. It was isolated in the 1980s, actually 1981 was first started to be observed. Uh, and actually uh, one of the lead people that was in charge of figuring out what was going on at the time was actually Dr. Fauci. Uh, Dr. Fauci ran the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, the agency that he still runs today uh, and played an integral part in the COVID diagnosis and COVID treatments. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, back in the early 80s, uh, he's been in that position leading that division for over 40 years. Um, and, you know, I personally have a lot of respect for him. Uh, 
a lot of my funding in graduate school came from his division from NIH. Uh, and I've actually got to meet the man a few times, uh, very knowledgeable, um, but he was really at the forefront of the discovery of HIV. Uh, so uh, HIV is a retrovirus, uh, causes acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Um, it causes a complex of symptoms such as pneumonia, which can be caused by pneumocystis, Carposi sarcoma. That's what you're seeing here on the skin, these lesions. Sudden weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, and general loss of immune function. Essentially what you have happening and what you're looking at here, the um, line in green is your viral load. The line in purple is your CD4 cells, which are your helper T cells. And what you can see as your viral load decreases, your helper T cells come down over time. So a few years out, uh, and once you sort of cross this point right here, uh, what they're indicating is stage four, for about four years out, um, you know, you can enter into what they refer to as AIDS. Now, nobody today should uh, actually get to that point, uh, especially if they're managing their disease with uh, treatments. Okay. Uh, but back in the 80s, uh, this was this was really a, a death sentence uh, for um, people, uh, you know, and unfortunately, it did break out mainly in the population of individuals that the CDC classifies as men having sex with men. Uh, but that's not something that you should think of today. I mean, uh, all about half, more than half now of cases of HIV are in uh heterosexual relationships. And um, there is preventative measures. Uh, if you are in a relationship that somebody has uh, HIV, um, you know, hopefully they are managing their disease with their treatment, their cocktail treatment. Uh, but you can also go on PrEP, which is prophylaxis uh, treatment, which reduces the risk of transmission, uh, even if it does occur from somebody that's uh, being treated for HIV. Uh, as I said, the treatment that today is, is extremely effective. Um, most individuals that have HIV uh, can actually uh, become what they refer to as undetectable. And if they are in that undetectable range, they cannot transmit uh, the HIV virus to another individual. So looking here, you can see some signs and symptoms that are tied to the level of the virus in the blood and level T cells in the blood. The initial infection is often attended by vague mononucleosis-like symptoms that soon disappear. In the second phase, the virus numbers in blood drop dramatically and antibody begins to appear. After a long period, most asymptomatic infection ensues. During this time, which can last from two to 15 years, swollen lymph nodes may be prominent symptom uh, during the mid to late asymptomatic period, the number of T cells in the blood will steadily decrease. Once the T cell level reaches a low threshold, the symptoms of AIDS can ensue. And once T cells drop below 200 cells per mil, AIDS results. Um, and essentially what that means is you no longer have a functional immune system. Initial symptoms include fatigue, diarrhea, weight loss, neurological changes. Uh, you can also have opportunistic infections and neoplasms, uh, severe immune deregulation, hormone imbalances and metabolic disturbances can occur. Weight loss, diarrhea, poor nutrition, absorption can also occur. You can have protracted fever, fatigue, sore throat, night sweats, uh, and then eventually lead to lesions on the brain, meningitis, um, or lesions of the meninges, the spinal cord, and the peripheral nerves. Uh, the causative agent is a lentivirus. Uh, this contains a reverse transcriptase that catalyzes the replication of double-stranded DNA from single-stranded RNA. And we talked about this uh, when we talked about viruses, the retroviruses. Uh, the viral genes become permanently integrated into the host genome. HIV is the most dominant form worldwide. Uh, and then you have HIV-2 with various subtypes that can exist. Uh, the general multiplication cycle of HIV, uh, the virus is absorbed and endocytosed 
and the twin RNAs are uncoded, reverse transcriptase will catalyze the synthesis of a single complementary strand of DNA. This single strand serves as a template for the synthesis of double-stranded DNA. In latency, double-stranded DNA is inserted into the host's chromosome as a provirus. After late period, various immune activators will stimulate the infected cell, causing reactivation of the provirus genes and the production of viral mRNAs. HIV mRNA is then translated by the cell's synthetic machinery into the viral components, such as the capsid reverse transcriptase and your spikes, and the viruses are assembled. Budding of mature viruses will lyse the infected cells. And this should look familiar to you because this is uh, what we talked about in the viral chapter there. Uh, transmission, uh, any form of intimate contact involving the transfer of blood can be a potential source of infection. Trauma, needle sharing, uh, needle sharing is big things. You know, you don't want to be sharing needles uh, and there's why you're oftentimes seeing, you know, uh, these safe injection sites. That's one of the things that they're trying to reduce um, sexual transmission is the most common in the U.S. Breast milk, uh, urine, tears, sweat, saliva are not considered sources of the infection. Since the beginning of the epidemic in 1980, 60 million have become infected and more than 30 million have died of HIV-related causes worldwide. The global estimate is 37 million infected worldwide, 1.1 million infections currently in the United States, 46% of those infected with HIV are not aware that they are infected with HIV. A person is diagnosed as having HIV infection if he or she has been tested positive for exposure to the human immunodeficiency virus. Now this diagnosis is not the same as having AIDS. <clears throat> Viral testing is based on a detection of antibodies specific to the virus in serum and other fluids, and they can test either by an ELISA, latex agglutination, or rapid antibody test. Diagnosis of AIDS is based on two criteria. Uh, diagnosis with stage three HIV infection requires both tests positive for the virus and a CD4 count of fewer than 200 cells per microliter. Prevention of HIV is avoidance of sexual contact with infected persons. Uh, barrier protection should be used when having sex with anyone whose HIV status is unknown, uh, such as using a condom or diaphragm. Uh, and actually just last week, the FDA finally approved a condom for uh, use for anal sex. Um, up until last week, there was not one that was approved for that. Uh, not sharing needles or by cleaning needles with leech and then rinsing before another use uh, is an area of infection. HIV positive individuals with uninfected partners should begin a re regiment of antiretroviral drugs. And clinical trials of various vaccines are ongoing. And actually, uh, they're starting, I think it's Moderna starting a clinical trial with an mRNA vaccine. Uh, now that that platform is out and being uh, used. Um, so quite exciting for that. Treatment should begin immediately after HIV uh, diagnosis. Uh, antiviral chemotherapy and a variety of drugs to prevent and treat opportunistic infections and other complications such as wasting disease are also... Um, uh, there's also a three-drug cocktail that contains two nucleoside analogs, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and one non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And like I said, the treatment today is actually very, very, uh, very good. Uh, so the mechanism of the action of the anti-HIV drugs, uh, we have a prominent group of drugs, AZT, DDL, and 3TC. These are your nucleoside analogs that inhibit reverse transcriptase. Then you have your protease inhibitors, and then you have your integrase inhibitors. So here is your table of um, HIV and AIDS. And then um, <clears throat> here is just a summary table of the different, the taxonomic summary table of all the diseases that we talked about. 
uh, here. And then here's the location on the body of all these particular diseases as well. All right, that's the end of the recording and the end of chapter 20.